I'd like to welcome the man himself. All right. Dave Nettle, turn the lights out. Thanks, Brendan. Woo. All right. So you come into these things nervous as it is, and that just really helped calm my nerves. So good stuff. Well, right on. Super psyched, as Brendan mentioned. Um, this series has been going on in one form or another since 1988. It's been great. It's been a community event. And when it kind of evolved to where Brendan and I were sitting down and thinking about um, having Alpenglow involved in running it for a while, uh, we were doing it at the Sawtooth Cafe that seated maybe 40 people comfortably. And we were thinking, I hope we can fill it. And so things have definitely been growing. It's been fantastic. And uh, it's, it's kind of a fun honor to be kind of wrapping up the, the uh, series this year. Um, before we get going, though, I want to do a special shout out somewhere out there in, what do they call it, streaming land? I don't even know, but uh, is a very dear friend of mine, and a lot of us can relate to this. She just had knee surgery today. So while we were all out there blowing through powder, she was blowing through some probably pretty heavy drugs. But she says she's watching tonight, so Annie, we all love you, and we're going to give you a round of applause. Get well, get healed. All right. All right. I always wonder if this is going to work when you push a button on a computer. So tonight, I've kind of decided to circle back around on a kind of a theme that was going on here the last few years. We all kind of went through one form or another of, um, of a COVID, of a pandemic experience. I don't think anyone was unaffected um, to some degree. And so this is talking about a return to the Alps after two years of things pretty much being shut down. Um, but I'm going to give a little bit of background on Europe, my experience in Europe, and also my fascination with the Alps. So from the very first time I started climbing and skiing, to me it was always like the Alps were where ultimately you had to go. It was where the history, where all the greats were, these huge um, granite spires, um, the huge glaciated peaks that dominated the landscape. It was pretty much what I was raised on when I first started climbing, thinking about the Alps. As a matter of fact, going through high school and college, I was usually like ditching out, hiding in the library, reading books like this rather than doing homework. A lot of the classics, um, I mean, even the title, Conquistadors of the Useless. What an inspiring title for a young person. It's like, hey, I got that for sure. I can, I can aspire to that. And the, the black and white photos just kind of seem to evoke this timeless era that it fascinated me and um, these seemingly impossible images of these climbers in France and Italy and Austria and Switzerland doing these crazy things that I wanted to do. Probably the one thing I found out I didn't want to do was a rappel like this, by the way, where you just run it between your crotch and over your shoulders. That's uh, not recommended. And just the wild scenes that you would see in the, the Alps, these crazy gendarmes and spires. Um, and also, and I know it sounds crazy, but it was like even the, what would you call it? I don't know, the, the, the Savoir Faire of these alpinists, wearing these ragtag clothes, old funky wool knickers and beat up shirts. I just was like, this is it. You know, this was like what I wanted to aspire to. So at a young age, of course, I acquired this look. This is... Uh, this is, uh, I was 14, and this is when I first started climbing. This, these were, this was actually one of the first artificial climbing areas pretty much in the country. This uh, mountain shop that I worked at, far west, that ended up becoming Mountain High, had hauled in these three boulders and then the spire and piled them up, and I instantly started just hanging out there and getting in the way. Um, but like... Check this out. I mean, that's some like serious edge work with an old pair of waffle stompers. I don't think I could get off the ground wearing these nowadays. And I don't even know why the rope is on my shoulder and there's a hammer involved, but it just was like, <laughs> that's what I saw in the books. And even later, and uh, Peter Mayfield will relate to this. Yeah. Still rocking the hairdo. <laughs> 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 
Anyway, even later, this is how I was doing the first big walls in Yosemite. Guys like John Backer and Ron Kalk must have been cracking up. I was showing up in knickers because that's what they did in the Alps, man. It had to work. But uh, anyway, this is a classic shot. Those were my roots. It's what I loved. And it was also the images of the Alps in the skiing. You know, these mountaineers that were skiing these huge traverses, um, do, launching off of like cliffs. Like I ended up doing that, but not on purpose. Um, but in the shadow of the Matterhorn and so on, it was just super exciting. And it was actually somewhat ironic that the first trip that I took to the Alps, to Europe, was a ski trip and not a climbing trip. I was definitely more a climber who skied, but um, this was in 1984, and that was state-of-the-art skis. It was low-top leather boots, um, and then three-pin skis, and that was, I think I, I had downsized from a pair of 210 to 205 centimeter skis. I was going short for maneuverability, you know? <laughs> and it was a fascinating introduction to skiing in the Alps, right off the bat trying to carve tele turns down through this glaciated terrain. Now, I had already been climbing in Alaska, but I hadn't been skiing, so this was an eye-opener. And then at the end of the day, coming into these comfortable huts, hanging out with people, and even when you would come down to a road, there were like taxis waiting for you. It was unbelievable. There were so many people doing these things, like in this case, the classic Chamonix um, to Zermatt uh, high route, or the Haute route. I love that old vehicle, but it was just like waiting, like by magic, and we would pile in, and you'd end up in these classic old French villages wandering around before the next morning, heading back up into the snows and continuing your ski tour. I was just becoming enamored with this way of, of traveling on skis, and then these long, long glaciated descents um, down these valleys. It was absolutely spectacular. And some of the huts were just amazing. This one, the Vignette Hut, um, on the Haute route there, and at the time, I hope it's changed, but I've got to point this out. At the time, the bathroom was this little building that was perched over the edge, and all it was was you would open the door, and it was the, the two-seater. Fortunately, I never had to share the seats with somebody else, but there was two just in case, and it just dropped into space, and what you had to do is perch yourself and be careful if you heard and felt the wind start blowing up you got out of there, it was done. Otherwise, you had a, yeah, you were revisiting your uh, visit there. The nice thing about being an American in Europe is you never had trouble picking your skis out of the selection there. It, it's like the lineup, you know, with the uh, criminals. Can you point out the one who has the long skis? It's like, anyway. But one time, very, very quickly, I remember this old timer had looked at those skis and he's like, tell him, Mark. And I ended up lending my, him my boots and he went out by the hut and made these beautiful arcing turns. It was kind of a nice little throwback. And uh, for me, I wanted to actually go beyond Zermatt and travel over the last pass, past the Britannia hut down into Sosfe. And fortunately, I'd actually at that point had a lot of like alpine climbing experience. And so this didn't really discourage me. But the whole group that had left the hut from Zermatt that day, everybody turned back. And it was kind of an interesting connection with the Alps, is crossing over and skiing down into Sosfe alone and completing this, uh, this high route. And uh, it wasn't until four years later that I made my first trip back to Europe in 88 with Jim Howell here, another Tahoe local, to go climbing. We had spent like two weeks getting hammered by horrendous weather, um, and finally the weather cleared, and we decided this was the time to launch on Mont Blanc. That was kind of like, for me, the ultimate would be to do a technical route on Mont Blanc. And so we chose the south face, kind of the Italian side. It doesn't really show it well, but it basically goes up this on the, uh, what they call the Brenva Spur, and we were pretty excited. You can see I'm pretty excited there. That's an enthusiastic young Dave Nettle on his first major ascent in the Alps. I, if I grew the mustache back, it wouldn't be the same color. That's why I don't grow it back. <laughs> Even just getting up to the first hut at the Trident Hut was technical climbing. It was wild to think that we were swinging these ice leads and then 
up in this little coal, this perched on the edge, this wild hut. We spent the night, and literally you begin the route by wrapping your rope over the railing and rappelling off the railing of the hut into the glacier and then hiking over to the base of the climb. Just, you know, and, and the exposure, looking down, that's looking down into the village of Cormayer on the Italian side. Just gorgeous climbing and the exposure on the Brenva Ridge was just breathtaking. Just felt like you were standing there perched between the snow and the sky. The final um, steep climbing up through the, the head wall towards the summit and uh, the first uh, ascent on my, for me in the Alps, a big one. You can see I've somehow managed to lose almost all the wool in my wardrobe, except for the gloves. Those were soon to follow. And back in Chamonix, you know, the classic statue, you know, from the first ascent. But for me, it was more like pointing like, these are the Alps. You've got to come back. This is the place you need to be coming back to year after year. And so for over the years, since 1984, when I first went there, um, I've returned to the Alps almost every year. Um, I've had the opportunity to climb a lot of the classic iconic routes like the Matterhorn you saw. This is high on the ridge on the Matterhorn there. The Eiger, the dreaded Eiger. Um, and the route that uh, I climbed on there with a good friend of mine, uh, John Fisher, was actually what they call the East Ridge or the Mitalegi Ridge, a technical route. But what was cool about it is you're taking the tram up through the heart of the Eiger, right inside, and it always stops and people get out and you can look out the windows. And then we would stay there and the train would continue. And you walk down these crazy old abandoned tunnels and then all of a sudden, where they used to spit out all the rock when they were building the tunnel, you're standing above the glaciers and you basically rappel out of this tunnel onto the glacier and begin your climb up to the hut. This is a classic middle eggy hut, one of the more spectacular locations um, that you can find in the Alps. And then the beautiful, elegant middle eggy ridge that leads up to the summit of the Eiger. And the Drew, um, for me, growing up, especially with those books that I showed you the pictures of, um, the thought of climbing the American Direct on the Drew had always been a dream. And so it was, uh, it was great to finally go there with my buddy Reuben Shelton. And we kind of employed the tactics that we had been learning here in the Sierra and Yosemite is rather than carrying a bunch of equipment and ice axes and crampons and going to the summit and descending down the easy route, we ended up choosing to reach the summit and repel the entire route, which ended up actually being a blessing in disguise because right when we got to the summit, um, a big storm swept across the Alps and we got out pretty much just in time. And the Alps has a lot of history as well, and it's not always uh, that encouraging. This is like a classic uh, repel anchor that you might find somewhere on these old routes, um, a tangle of old pitons, Sometimes that's your only choice of protecting these routes that were established in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and the equipment is still there. And this one is one of my favorites right there. An old chunk of wood with some baling wire. And what's classic is like you're climbing up and you're already kind of run out and you see this and you go, that is ridiculous. That's stupid. There's no way. And then you look around, there's no gear, and you're like, I'm clipping it. <laughs> And this next one is like my favorite piece of protection that was on the Italian side of the Matterhorn here. And this is a little shout out to my buddy Tom Lane. I hope you sponsored this uh, lakey pole. Somebody had hammered it into the rock for a handhold to get over a vertical section. They're like, ah, oh, yeah. When in doubt, use your ski poles. Lakey. Um, and also, since 1984, I've been just had the pleasure of returning to the Alps um, about 15 times to do different hut-to-hut -hut ski trips. And each time I, for the most part, each time I go, it's a different trip um, in a different country, a different set of huts, but they all share some great things in common. Excellent lodging. Here's, this is the uh, Lake Tahoe Literary Club. Um, hard at work ready for the book review, and of course, uh, and the nice light snacks that you get in the afternoon after a hard day of touring, just something to knock the edge off your appetite until dinner time. And then dinner hits, and it's a full-on affair. These huts are amazing. Um, the food that they serve, it's all um, just a fun social time. 
and you've got the great food, you've got the great wine and beer, whatever you're drinking, and then depending on the mountain, region, or even the country, they all have their special little schnapps type drinks. Um, and it's amazing how the littlest glasses cause the biggest trouble, but uh, we'll leave that to your imagination. And the touring on these routes um, takes you through some spectacular terrain. Um, and it's wild to think on a lot of these tours, you're just a few miles away from civilization. Um, a lot of it is very accessible, and then you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. Sometimes you're carrying your skis over these wild ridge lines to get to another, the next ski descent. Um, sometimes skis aren't even involved. This is a, like a very exposed rock move up near the top of climbing the Grand Paradiso in northern Italy. And then always the awesome summit with uh, great people that will be special to us always, um, sharing these summits, these smiles. Super amazing. Um, pleasure to have summited so many peaks in the Alps with, with good people. Oh, and I might mention there is skiing, by the way. We don't just eat and drink. Fantastic skiing on these uh, huge descents. All the, um, the, the huts are usually just open from the middle of March to kind of early May, so it's very much spring-like. So you have these long, beautiful corn snow descents on these glacier runs um, that take you down to the valleys to the next hut. But it, there's always at least one or two days on these trips where there's that surprise spring powder. Um, and it just is amazing. You're, you pick up a couple of runs like this right in the middle of your hut-to-hut uh, -hut trip. This photo of blower powder was taken in the first part of April on the Silvretta uh, hut trip in Austria. And then at the end of these hut trips, you've got that great feeling, the satisfaction, the last little walk um, back through an alpine village, maybe back to a train, maybe back to the hotel where you started. So you kind of get the idea. For me, for you know, close to 40 years, the Alps had been a very special place you know, to return to. And I'd always, I never like, took it for granted, but I, I felt like that was always gonna be something that I would do each year. Um, the Alps were a place not just for beautiful mountaineering, climbing, and skiing, but it was a real amazing worldview of what was going on, talking to people from different countries, their perception of what was going on in the United States, their perception of what was going on in the world. And so you were like feet on the ground hearing it from our neighbors across the big puddle there. Um, and so for me, it was like, it came as kind of like a real blow in a way when in March um, in 2020, just a week before flying over to France to do the Van Wa's Haute route, um, of course, you guys all know, most of you are here unless you're one years old. <laughs> COVID. We don't get to talk about it that much anymore, but it was a real thing. Like I said, it definitely was a speed bump in a lot of people's lives, um, some more dramatic than other, others. Um, but for, for myself, it was one of those things where you really wondered how much it was going to change things going forward in the world. And, you know, just like even a quick look here, what's interesting is like even when it kicked off and things were really shutting down, there was still actually, if you look at these statistics, there were still a lot of people traveling for, you know, um, you know basically vacations or visiting cities with restrictions, but the huts were particularly affected. You cannot have social distancing in a tiny little hut, right? You're in each other's face constantly, and that's actually one of the cool things about it, is being at a t in a little room, around a table, five different languages going on, people interacting, hugs, high fives, cheers. So the, the whole pandemic pretty much shut down the entire hut-to-hut -hut, um, uh, program throughout the entire Alps. So it was a great relief um, last spring when things began to lighten up and the huts began to um, open and the word got out that uh, we were able to follow through with our plans. And so I headed over there um, and ended up kind of doing a multi-country um, circuit and kind of got the best of the Alps here. This is with uh, Rochelle and my cousins uh, David and Norma Jean. We ended up going over to the Ortler Alps in uh, northern Italy but the thing is, they were having like a particularly bad season, kind of like we were having here last year. They had a big, big snowfall in uh, December and then nothing. And the snow, you know, you, you never want to say it was bad snow, right? It's always, no, it was a bad skier. 
This was bad snow. It was pretty miserable. Um, it, had had, it had been rotting and getting stepped on, stomped on, skied on, crisscrossed for about six weeks with no other uh, snowfall. And so we arrived here at the Pizzini Hut and decided, though, to make the most of it um, and ended up, uh, Rochelle and I ended up climbing the Grand Zebru, one of the major peaks in the Ortler Alps. And I'm pointing this out just to give you guys a little perspective. I was over here, this was one of the first hut-to-hut -hut trips that I did in the Alps, and in 2011, um, a big crew here in this front row, by the way, with me, we were skiing powder descent down this gully, and here we are climbing it, and there's not even any snow in it. It's just rock and gravel. But once you get through the rock and gravel, eh, not so bad, right? You get up into the snow. So here's uh, Rochelle on kind of a moderate, not super technical, but super exposed, kind of high consequence climb to kind of one of the rooftops of the Alps. An absolutely spectacular view. So the one thing that I found in my travels is that, man, if you go over there to do one thing and it's not in condition, or the weather's not good, all you have to do is head north or south a little bit and you're gonna find something good. You're either climbing in the sun in Italy or skiing powder north in Austria. So it's, it's a good place to go. One of the biggest problems though with poor snow in the Alps is you end up back at the hut at about noon. Um, <clears throat> yes. The secret is don't start with the little glasses. Start with the wine glasses here. But uh, we ended up, you know, making the most of our Ortler hut experience, not on skis, but in there. And as the evening went on, Norma Jean and Rochelle, when you get the two of them together, they are a whirlwind. This is actually not a blurred photo. This is like a scientific photo I'm about to show that actually shows what Dave Bowers is seeing at the table. <laughs> this is a whole new app that you can get. These girls were going crazy, and believe me, you get two American girls in a European hut, center of attention, whether you wanted it or not. <laughs> but so we decided to pivot, and instead of trying to force a hut-to-hut -hut trip in the Ortlers, we ended up having this phenomenal tour of the northern Italian resorts, Santa Catarina, Bormio, Livorno, and um, halfway through it, just like here, Mother Nature delivered, and we started getting a miracle march in the Alps, and it started dumping spring snow, and it was awesome. We went from bad corn snow conditions to cold blower powder skiing throughout uh, northern Italy. It was fantastic. And this is your classic light Italian lunch in between runs, in zero visibility, right? Yeah, exactly. Actually, this is an internet. Yeah, this is a, a global lunch here. So Rochelle and I uh, dropped uh, Dave and Norma Jean off and continued our tour to St. Anton. And I was like chatting it up with these guides. These are the uh, the four top examiners in Austria. And um, for some reason, they got tired of talking to me about guiding and kind of gravitated towards Rochelle there. So this was our first day, first run, first lift of our trip um, in St. Anton. I highly recommend the resort. I think Rochelle would agree. Most of the European resorts have this thing going now that they kind of call rondas or interconnections where they've connected several ski resorts together and in St. Anton they call it the run of fame and basically it's a route where you start in one place and you spend the entire day just skiing your way linking ski resorts and make your way back. It ends up being about 65 kilometers of skiing and it's about all you can do in a day. It is so fun and you're just like looping through these beautiful open piece um, with the Arlberg Alps in the background. From there, we continued on to Switzerland, and we spent uh, a couple of days in Zermatt, and uh, there is something extremely special about skiing in the shadow of the Matterhorn. It's just, it's such an iconic mountain, and so for a couple of days, we were there. We stayed in a real cool hut right on mid-mountain, so in the morning, you just put your skis on, and you're right in the middle of a, uh, one of the runs, descending down with the Brighthorn, Monte Rosa, and a lot of the glaciers in the background. So finally, we crossed through Chamonix, 
went through the tunnel and ended up back in France, um, in France here, in the Trois Valley, the Three Valley area here in this little town of Champenay um, in Van Oise. And this is where we met up with our, my Hut to Hut crew. And this is a, a cast of usual suspects that I've had the pleasure to share many adventures with. We've got Laura Ward there, Monica Burks, we got Seth there, Waller, and Mike Slats Slattery, and then Rochelle, who is there joining us as well. And this was a beautiful little hotel in the small village, the Les Glieres Hotel. And what was cool about this is that uh, Jean-Francois and his wife, Beatrice, they have owned this for years and years. And I made a reservation deposit here two years earlier, and almost every month they would send me an email and just be like, we are so excited we await your return. No problem, your deposit is here until you come. And so when we finally showed up, um, we were treated to some great French Alpine hospitality. So for the first day, you know, we kind of wanted to get the group together and get serious about the route here. So you can see, uh, this is our, my serious team. We are, uh, actually spent one day just skiing in the Trois Valley, linking the resorts of Courchevel, Mirabel, Val Thorens, just spending the whole day. The two feet of fresh snow made the conditions excellent, and it was bluebird. So after that day, um, Rochelle, I know it's kind of cute, isn't it? Rochelle and I uh, had been to have this whole trip planned, but she wasn't going to do the hut-to-hut -hut trip. She wanted to have her own adventure, and I had kind of suggested, you know, you can actually link resorts from where we are there in La Plan, and you can almost connect resorts continuously with just a taxi or two all the way to Chamonix. And she goes, that sounds great, but I don't have any information. I got, hey, don't worry. I will get you some detailed information. So I drew her a map. <laughs> what? How could you go wrong, right? <laughs> Actually, I, I, oh, yeah, here we are. So there's our little hut, you know, and you go up La Plan, and then you, like, ski on down here, Les Arcs, and then you head on over, and you go to Val de Zarentines, and you cross into Italy, and then there's a bunch of stuff here you do, and you ski, and, and you're in Chamonix, you got it. She skied with this. This is what she took. It was awesome. <laughs> anyway, yeah, if you guys need any beta on these trips, come see me. So while she was off on her adventure, um, the rest of us headed off on what's called the Van Wa's Haute Route. And it's just, um, it's not any one specific route, but it is a way to link up a lot of different huts um, and do a traverse where basically you're starting in one of the largest ski complexes in Europe, the Trois Valley, and then you pop into one of the greatest um, national parks and wilderness areas in Europe. It's just such a cool thing. So we were able to use lifts, um, taking them all the way up to the top of the resort in Val Thorens um, before popping out of the resort and into the uh, backcountry. And everyone was excited. In this case, I think Seth might have been a little too excited. We're in this tiny gondola. We got all the time in the world. He starts putting his skins on. Like, he's ready. You can see Monica in the lower left. She's like, watch out, watch out here. And he's swinging those things around. He's like, I'm ready, man. I'm ready. We're going to do this hut trip. Let's get this thing done. But um, it was good to see the enthusiasm. And when we got off at the top lift, this is how you know you're about to enter into the place you want to go. When you start reading warning signs, it's like, okay, there's our route, you know. So you leave the, uh, the resort here at the, uh, the Col du Val Thorens, the Col du Thorens, and as you can see, it's well-traveled. That's the one thing I want to just point out, because you're going to see this as this uh, kind of the presentation unfolds. You don't go to Europe for a wilderness experience. You go there for all the reasons you're seeing here. If you want a wilderness experience, we live there, right? You go to the Sierra backcountry, you go into desolation, but you go to Europe for a whole different ski experience. And in this case, um, as you can see, there's a lot of people that are out there doing these routes, and it becomes a very cool cultural social thing. But you leave the resort behind, you can see the ski lifts in the background, and then we passed over the, um, the, the, the final coal before beginning our trip, and the Chevrolet, the Col de Chevrolet. And there's that, always that excitement on the first downhill ski descent, when, you know, you've been thinking about these hut trips, you've been planning, you've been skiing at the resorts, and now it's at those first turns, 
and launching on down. And again, like I said, that two feet of fresh snow saved the day. We went from what would have been very grim conditions to a lot of fun. Beautiful open glacier skiing, um, boot deep sun warm powder, and then these long glacier descents. So you could kind of just pick where you wanted to go. We were off to one side and then looking over at another group making turns, super cool. And then just kind of wheedling your way down the glacier in towards the valleys. And the, uh, the temperatures were starting to raise. It's not unlike what happened here today. Like one yesterday, it was like cold and stormy, and then all of a sudden it's like 40 degrees. Same thing was happening over there, and the snow was changing. And we were starting to see some of those spring wet slides on this fresh snow. Um, and so, you know, a little bit more heads up. And you could even see here, things were getting pretty funky. The snow was beginning to move around. And the one thing to keep in mind was that a week earlier, that was all grass. Now we've got two feet of rapidly warming snow on top of wet grass. So we were definitely motivated to get through that, um, hopping down through this kind of junk here on this one particular run. And finally, fortunately, seeing our hut, the refuge uh, Roque de la Peche, the first hut for the night. And it's great. You go through all this crazy sun-warm glop, and things are feeling a little sketchy. And then all of a sudden, you roll into the hut, and everything is all right. Um, the beverages come out. Another light little charcuterie plate to knock the edge off before dinner. Monica looking very happy there. Oh. I would go back on that one maybe. And very cool hanging out on these decks. This is very typical. Showing up, um, listening to the different languages of people that have been touring, watching the mountain avalanche, the sweet sound of tumbling wet slop. Yeah. Order another glass of wine. Look the other way. And these huts all have special character. This particular one, the Roque de la Peche, was like amazing. The, uh, the woodwork and the metalwork in there is absolutely beautiful. And the food was amazing. This is like just another typical dinner. There's Seth kind of eyeballing my chicken leg there. <laughs> it's like, hey, man, you got your own. And then the next morning, booting up, getting ready for the day. Checking that smell in your boots, making sure that, yep, yeah, that's my boot. I recognize that smell. <laughs> and as we started off that morning, it was kind of cool. There's, uh, there's a lot, of, like I mentioned, a lot of history in the Alps. And so even these little random spots, all of a sudden there's this old church that looks all dilapidated. But then you see like this beautiful woodwork and a peak of this mosaic in the, the window in the back there. So all these like amazing little um, vignettes that you get along the way that you would never even know were there. So crossing the creek and heading over onto the north exposure, the snow got a lot better and we found ourselves working out above the kind of the, the warm valley and back up into the high country here and finally getting up to the next coal, Col du Aswas. And by the way, my French is terrible, so if anyone here actually knows how these are pronounced, just laugh or something. But uh, yeah, the uh, beautiful coal up here. This is uh, at about 10,000 feet, and then dropping in on the sun-warm side and just finding these beautiful turns. A lot of it is about the timing during the day. And, you know, you've got maybe, in this case, we had a 2,000-foot descent down to our hut. And we just kind of kept going further and further down traversing over, dropping in, trying to get fresh tracks, following the best snow where the, the, the sun had kind of lightly warmed it, and finally just skiing it right on down to the snow line. Yeah, and literally down to the snow line. Some places might re report this as intermittent skier packed powder. Because um, <laughs> we're actually on snow, so... And then arriving at our next hut, the beautiful, uh, recently rebuilt uh, Dent Parashi um, hut, located on this beautiful ridge with a gorgeous view. And it was kind of cool. Um, you know, the snow level might be low, but the beers are always full. So there's Monica and Seth enjoying a, a light hydration. You got to stay hydrated on these trips, you know, for... And the hut was famous for this guy, Frank, 
um, who was the hut keeper, the hut warden. But this guy here was a, a Sherpa from a Nepalese village that would come out every spring and work in the hut. Um, and he was just a super friendly, happy guy. And you know, we just had a great time um, chatting it up with him. I love this shot here. So they always like identify the table where you're going to sit. And usually it's a little nice folded piece of paper. This looked more like, you know, the convict. Like, you know, you're being sent off to Devil's Island in France, you know, or something like that. You can see some wine was involved in the background there. Perhaps. And the dinners are, are great. You've seen a couple photos of them already. Um, but it's very much family style where you end up at a table with some people that you've never met before from different countries, and it's super fun. Here's a gal serving up the soup. Everyone takes their turn. Um, we needed somebody to serve the main dinner, um, somebody who was like, skilled at handling uh, wieners, and Seth volunteered, uh, being an expert in that category. So uh, <laughs> it's all about teamwork. So the next morning from the Dent Perici um, hut, it was pretty low, as you saw. Um, and so, you know, with the snow getting warmer as we're skinning, putting our skins on, everyone's going, well, do you think we need skin wax, glop stopper? And I thought for the day, I would recommend more like fertilizer. Um, yeah, so fortunately, we only had to do this for three miles. No, I'm kidding. Just about 50 feet. And then we got back up into the high country. And that's fairly typical. Even on big years, a lot of times you find yourself walking, um, you know, big snow years. It's just part of the deal. You're doing a, a ski mountaineering traverse. It involves pretty much everything. And in this case here, the snow angle getting a little steeper, a little firmer. We're on the north exposure here. And this was the final booting up to the Col du Labi which was uh, our highest point of the coals on our trip at about 11,000 feet, and we had a 3,000-foot vertical descent down to our next hut. And being on the sunny side, we were able to just milk it. Um, you know, you try to time these things so that you hit the snow in the best conditions. There's no need to get a super crack -a dawn start. You want to let things kind of warm up a little bit. And just making turn after turn. And as we got... Uh, down even a little bit lower here, there was one last traverse and then a final kind of ragged descent down to the hut. And I'm going to point this out. You can see the conditions by the quality of the turns. Conditions were not so good. But that's not a rock. That's a skier. I skied by him and this poor guy was like crawling down the slope with a broken ski. It was like kind of flopping around. I'm like, are you okay? He goes, I'm fine. My guide's in the hut. You know, probably having a beer. You know, and so this poor guy is crawling down the slope and there was really nothing we could do with it. He was fine. It was just his ski was broken and so he was going to make it to the hut. So, uh, you know, we did what the right thing to do is go to the hut and think about him and have a beer knowing he would eventually get there. And there's nothing better to go with a cold beer in the hut than another light charcuterie plate. Very artistic. So what was crazy is, so we're sitting there, we're enjoying a nice adult beverage, we're munching on this, and all of a sudden, right in front of us, like literally right outside the window, this helicopter lands. Now around here, if you see a helicopter land, you're like, oh man, some guy's leg got torn off. Well, they're picking up our little buddy who was crawling with a broken ski. The, the French gendarmes came to rescue the guy because he had a broken ski. They flew him down to town. He got, went to a rental shop, rented a new pair of backcountry skis, took a train, and then skinned up and met his group at the next hut the next morning. That doesn't happen every day. That is a European thing for sure. It's like, oh, I've got a hangnail. <laughs> Heli. <laughs> It was pretty cool, though, watching it right in front. They were very professional. So you can kind of see here, at, at this year in the low snow conditions, um, it was looking a little grim leaving the hut, but, you know, we knew that better skiing was up above and just making the most of it. You can't complain about sitting out in the sun on a beautiful alpine day looking across at the Alps. And dinner, again, you can see there's a theme here, right? Like, you better prepare to eat. You don't go on these hut trips to lose weight, for sure. And the, uh, the food is magnificent. And uh, slats, 
kind of had been living in Chamonix. He's, he's kind of our global ambassador. He's the man of all seasons, the man of all cultures. You can see he's showing the way to properly eat pasta in France, right? He's composed. He's using a fork and a spoon. But if that ain't your style, man, you can just like get her done. Or Seth. I'm like looking at this picture when I was putting the show together, like, he's got a knife. You don't use a knife. You don't, you don't take a knife to a pasta fight. I think that was just to like keep people from getting his food. <laughs> eh. yeah, yeah, don't bother me while I'm eating. No. <laughs> uh. But the next morning, it didn't take long to get into the high country and back to some good skiing, um, booting up. You can look back. Um, that's the direction we came from. That's the, uh, the uh, peak that the, they call the Perchi in the background. And you can even see the coal lobby way off in the background in the distance. Spectacular, looking back at where you've come from. And the day was heating up. We had some great corn snow skiing down to a basin. And uh, one great trick when it's super hot like that, you don't want to carry a bunch of water because of the weight. You can literally scrape a little bit of that soft snow, sun warm snow, and just lay them across the top sheet of your ski for about five minutes or less. And it's almost water and you can just refill your bottle. It was really cool. So we finally got up. This was crossing the last pass um, that we were going to have to cross for our trip, uh, the Col du Dard, a very broad plateau with about a 2,000, I think it, maybe even more than that, maybe a 3,000 foot ski descent down to our final hut of the trip. You can tell that it was a two foot fresh snowfall, <laughs> just measure the crown, so a lot of things slipping and sliding, but for the most part, if you avoided those areas, it was great corn snow skiing. And finally ending up down at the hut, our final hut, the, uh, the Col, du, uh, Col du Van Waas hut, kind of the namesake of the whole range. Beautiful hut there. Um, this is a feeling everybody has at the end of a long ski tour. You cannot, no matter how much fun you have in life skiing, everyone loves it when you take that boot off, especially after a day of touring with a little pack on. And there's, some, uh, there's Monica in a very happy place. Yeah, yeah, she's happy. That's our little snack again. And Laura having her little snack, <laughs> which I was joining her with, by the way. Yeah, it's easier to swallow than, you know, anything else. So. So in the evening, these huts are great. You hear everybody murmuring about the next day. And one of the big attractions is uh, climbing the Grand Cass, the main peak, the highest point in the Van Waas range. And it's kind of like the culmination of a trip. I always like to do, it doesn't have to be at the end of the trip, but I always like to have at least one major summit on these uh, hut to hut trips. And so you could tell the energy, because a lot of these folks in this hut were going to do the same thing the next morning. And they're talking about having their breakfast at like 4 a.m. and getting this alpine start. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. We want to be the last ones out of the hut. We do not want to be on this mountain when it's rock solid ice. So we were just kind of chilling out. And so the next morning, we actually waited until the sun hit the hut. I have to think we were, if not the last, some of the last people out of the hut. But what was great about it is that it was very relaxed. We weren't in the Ramba, you know, line of everybody going up the mountain. Got to the point now where even still with a little bit of late start, nice and icy, the boot crampons go on and we really get into the ski mountaineering mode. Very firm snow conditions here. Again, the longer we were going to wait, the better, because we were planning to ski down the same route that we were climbing. And at that point, you would not want to be skiing down. It was like a sheet of ice. So as we started climbing up, this was kind of on the West Glacier, um, one of the main routes that people take up there. It started getting steeper and steeper. But fortunately, the day was getting warmer and warmer, and things were looking great. But amazing exposure, and that's going to looking down uh, the route that we will eventually be skiing down. And then we reach the final summit ridge, kind of windblown, so not a lot of snow. We dropped our skis and then made the last little walk to the summit, which was just this gorgeous ridge line. Um, beautiful, beautiful exposure. And then the summit of the Grand Cass, um, kind of the rooftop of the Van Waas Alps. Yeah, woo! 
Good stuff. No, it really is. You know, these are ski tours, but there's a real mountaineering edge to it that I love, right? You break out the crampons and you have this final summit that you reach. And then the ski down, heads up, no fall zone, definitely. And, you know, even though I'm not really guiding these trips, we're all just friends and I'm kind of just like maybe the, the ringleader. Still, man, my heart is in my throat watching my best friends and just going, man, don't blow an edge while I'm watching. <laughs> but on the descent down, surrounded by these uh, glaci glaciated peaks, spectacular. And then finally down that main face on the glacier. And this was a crack up. It, again, it's not like I felt like I had to go first, but I was kind of like milking the slope and kind of feeling for where the snow was. And Laura kept like, let's just go, let's just go, let's get down this thing. And I'm like, simmer, simmer. <laughs> you know? Anyway, there's a little bit of strategy on these things, but we finally started getting down into this point where you can see here, the snow is softening up and our late start was definitely paying off. And we ended up gliding down and getting great turns. You can see the tracks from people before us just hanging on survival. We had waited just long enough where it was just butter and these beautiful turns of 4,400 foot descent from the summit. Amazing. Nice leg burner. And down we have a short skin, very short skin back up to the hut. And almost immediately it was a hot day. You know, the topic is like, you know, so what's the beverage? a nice cold frothy beer or a crisp local wine? And of course the answer is yes. <laughs> so as, the, as our final evening on the hut trip kind of unfolded, it was kind of cool watching other groups begin to plan because you can do these trips in either direction. And like this was just one example, this group of young gals all excited. They were going to be basically doing the same trip we did in reverse. And so they were asking for some advice and it was just cool watching them pouring over the maps and just relating to uh, their adventure ahead. And we ended up uh, kind of befriending this, uh, this the couple of these guys. The, guy, the younger guy on the left there is a, a full certified French ski guide and he was going on this tour with his father-in-law in the striped shirt. And as kind of the evening went on and we were just sharing things, again, you know, different worldviews about life, about the U.S. versus France, all these things, I found that he and I had a ton in common. We had both been born in 1957, and despite having been in two different parts of the world growing up, we had a bunch in common. And as you can see here, the thing we have most in common now is a desperate need for a shampoo. That is... I think, I think he got attacked by like a weasel and somebody hit me with a, like a cube of butter. <laughs> and maybe a little more suntan lotion. <laughs> so our final morning leaving the, uh, the Col de Van Oise hut, um, hiking up a little bit through the, uh, the, the grass here to get to a high point before our final descent. And it was just kind of cool just standing there looking back um, you know, in the direction that we had been coming for the last five days, kind of reflecting on the trip before that final descent uh, back towards civilization. And the view up, uh, the Grand Cass, showing the route um, that we had skied, oh, I think I have a pointer, that we had skied the day before. Beautiful glacial run. And then a long descent down the valley, finally crossing the bridge, that actually conveniently led right to the top of a, a ski lift on a ski resort, and we hit it literally as the chair was just starting to run. So here we are, we pop out of this backcountry experience, and we now have 2,000 feet of fresh, unskied corduroy all the way down valley to wrap things up. That was just the grand finale. And the beautiful view looking down into the village of um, Prolognon, and even where normally that would just be grass, they keep these like ribbons of snow going so that even in the late spring, you can ski all the way down to the very end, just gliding down fresh corduroy, kind of a glory run, ending up about 100 steps from a nearby cafe. And while I was calling a taxi to come pick us up, we were indulging in some of France's finest little coffee treats here. Great shot of... Uh, Monica in a very happy place there. Nose deep in a little uh, French creme. 
So the taxi shows up. Again, it's just like clockwork. Um, we pile everything in, and in short order, we find ourselves back at the hotel, Les Glieres, where we started. We have all our stuff waiting there for us that we've left. Beatrice and Jean-Francois welcome us like we're like family returning, and we have this great dinner. An amazing, amazing return to the Alps, um, and a fantastic hut trip with, with great friends. And, you know, kind of just in wrapping up, a lot of times we kind of like go through life either where you don't know what you've got till it's gone or you take it for granted, right? There's these like two opposites. And what I've tried to do my whole life, and certainly after COVID, it really reminds you that you really want to take more of that middle ground. Definitely know what you've got, love it, but don't take it for granted. Live every day fully, get out there and charge, love the people that you're with, and uh, ski fresh powder as often as possible. All right. Okay. Woo! All right, thank you very much.